Welcome to the Celtics Pod. I'm Eric Van Bosch. I am back. That's right. I'm still alive, folks. Uh, it's uh, been it's been an extended amount of time since I've done the uh, Celtics Pod. And I apologize for that. I'm disappointed that I haven't been able to uh, do one. But I've a lot going on. Obviously, it all started when I uh, went on vacation. I went on vacation for uh, more than a week, and I wanted to do a podcast. But I do these things at work. And while I was on vacation, I I did not want to come into work. I didn't want to come into this building while I was on vacation. So I was just like, all right, I just won't do a podcast. Um, you know, and then, and then I come back and then other folks are on vacation. I ended up doing a morning show uh, for two weeks, filling in. And then you got holidays. You know, we've had these snowstorms and these brutal temperatures bitterly cold like for so long it's just been like single digits and sub-zero temperatures so I end up getting sick so on top of all those other things I end up getting sick and uh feel much better obviously but like still my nose is so congested like I can't even breathe through it you know but who needs that not important right but uh things getting back to normal obviously with these holidays behind us and then um Temperature is supposed to rise a little bit, so uh, I guess that will be better going forward, I guess. And it's not just Maine. It's not just Bangor, you know. So it's uh, very cold out there. And I know when I'm watching these uh, Celtics games, you know, Mike, Tommy, Scal, whoever, always talking about how cold it is. And when the Celtics played the Nets, they said it was really cold uh, in in that building. Or actually not versus – they said in the Barclays Center, the temperatures were fine. But it was the previous uh, home game, the last home game before that, where they said it was just so cold inside TD Garden. But this next game, Celtics end up winning 87-85 Saturday at Barclays Center. Celtics are now 33-10. They've rattled off six straight wins. So the Celtics have the second-best record in the NBA, trailing just Golden State at 32-8. and eight. So that next Nets game... Uh, an exciting game, or at least an exciting finish anyway. I mean, neither team shot the ball very well. They both shot pretty poorly. Celtics ended up getting out-rebounded by quite a bit, 55-44. Sees winning the turnover battle by a landslide, though. Just four for Boston, 16 for uh, the Nets. And one of the biggest stories uh, coming out of that game was the play of Jason Tatum late in the basketball game. He came up big for the Celtics. And he's been a clutch performer for Boston this year. He's played so well in the fourth quarter. You know, he's had a fantastic rookie season. And he he plays, you know, four great quarters of basketball. So he plays great throughout the game. But, you know, come fourth quarter, you know, he he, he doesn't slow down. You know, he continues to come through uh, in the final frame as well. And he did versus the Nets. He had that jam late in the fourth. He set a screen for Kyrie. And then Kyrie uh, kicked it to Tatum. And then he just blew right past Hollis Jefferson and it was a pretty sick one-handed jam. Put the Celtics up by one point with just over a minute to go. And then with about 45 seconds to go, he knocked down a three in the corner, put the Celtics up by four points. So he came up big time for the Celtics. Now the Nets, they had the opportunity to tie that basketball game, send it in overtime, or or win it with a three or whatever. You know, but they... Uh, They did not get that done. Spencer Dinwiddie had a chance to tie the game when he attacked the basket. He ended up colliding with Shemi Ojale. And, you know, rule of uh, of verticality, Shemi goes up vertically, no call. Dinwiddie was not able to get off a good shot. Scal pointed out on that play that Shemi was actually late coming over from the weak side. And Scal said, you know, Shemi fell asleep on that play, but then Dinwiddie bobbled the ball on his way to the basket, so that may have given, you know, um, Ojale the second that he needed to get over there. And then after that, you know, after the uh, inbounds pass, you know, the Nets again had opportunities to tie that basketball game. They got off at least two shots, and the ball was battled around, uh, batted around several times. You know, one of those may have been an attempted tip-in, you know, and Shemi contested another shot on that. He contested uh, Hollis Jefferson's shot. So a very exciting finish and uh, some physical play during the game as well. You know, they've played uh, some good games versus the Nets this year. 
And uh, now we're starting to throw in a little physicality. You're going to like that. It's always fun to watch. Aaron Bain set that screen on Hollis Jefferson. And Hollis Jefferson collided really hard with uh, Bain's shoulder. And it looked like Hollis Jefferson's jaw just like bounced right off of uh, Bain's shoulder. And Hollis Jefferson goes down. He gets back up. He's looking a little woozy. You know, like he just took a big, you know, punch during a fight or whatever. So he gets up, he looks all woozy and stuff, and then he's all PO'd and, you know, teams, you know, players got to hold him back and stuff like that. So, yeah, if you're playing the Celtics and one of your boys goes after Aaron Baines, hold him back. <laughs> Be like, hey, man, just just stop, breathe, count to 10, do whatever. Uh, Daniel Tice, he collided with Quincy AC. Another moment where things, uh, you know, got a little testy there. Uh, AC was attacking the basket, and then Tice went up to contest the shot. They collided. AC went down hard. Like, he went down really hard. He landed on his backside. And then uh, AC gets up, and he just walks into Tice with his shoulder, just kind of, like, gives him a shot with his shoulder. Uh, Brooklyn, you got to respect the way that the Brooklyn Nets play. You really do. I mean, they pl- they play really hard. They don't give up on a basketball game. And if you play the Nets and you don't show up for that ba- that game, you know, the Nets, they may beat you because they will show up. So they're playing a little bit better this year, which, of course, makes Danny Ainge look, look very smart because obviously, you know, the Celtics traded their final Brooklyn pick to Cleveland in the uh, Kyrie deal. You know, and then last year, the Brooklyn pick, which the C's traded, I mean, or they, you know, they swapped one for three. That Brooklyn pick ended up being the number one overall pick in the draft last year. That was last year. This year, there are eight teams worse than Brooklyn right now. So the C swap number one for number three from Philly. Celtics end up drafting Jason Tatum and getting a conditional 2018 pick. So in next year's draft, if the Lakers pick lands between two and five, the Celtics get the Lakers pick. You know, guess what? The Lakers have the second worst record in the NBA right now. So the Celtics may end up getting that Lakers pick. And so obviously Danny Ainge is looking wicked smart. And it's it's funny because, you know, these moves that he's made recently in these drafts have just, you know, the Celtics have made some really good decisions in these drafts recently. Um and, and initially, fans, you know, aren't on board with these things. You know, fans booed Wick Grossbeck at the TD Garden viewing party during the draft in which the Seas drafted Jalen Brown. And how did that turn out? Seems to me like Celtics fans have fully embraced Jalen Brown. You know, and then, you know, I, I, the, the, where they swapped the number one for the number three and people realized at that point the C's weren't getting Markel Fultz. I mean, there were some people who were upset about that and people who thought it was the wrong move. But here they do, you know, Here, then they end up with this uh, conditional 2018 pick in Jason Tatum. So once again, you know, the C's looking pretty smart. So speaking of Jason Tatum, rookie of the month for the month of December. He, dr- he dropped uh, 14 points per game during the month of December, six rebounds per game. He has shot the ball very well throughout the season, including last month. 53% from the field, 45% from three-point range. Still can't believe how well he's shooting the ball. You know, this is a guy who said when he was in college that he wasn't comfortable shooting the three, and now look at him knocking them down at, you know, 45% for the month of uh of December. So obviously that shot has developed pretty rapidly. He did lead all rookies in points in December, and that month he was second among all rookies in rebounds. So the game for him versus the Nets came up big at the end, ended up finishing with 14 points, six six uh six rebounds. Need some other fine plays in that game also. Uh, he had a pretty sick jam in the third. Uh, Tatum and sick jam is just like I I see a theme here it's like every night he's attacking the basket and he's you know he gives you one of those uh one of those monster jams that gets everybody everybody off their seed but in the third verse of the Nets a little hesitation dribble blows past Hollis Jefferson and the monster one-handed jam and then in the third there was that alley-oop pass 
from Marcus Morris. Now Marcus Morris passed, passed the ball from nearly midcourt, and then uh, Tatum slammed it home. So some exciting highlights, uh, courtesy of Jason Tatum in that game. Now, you would like to see Jason Tatum play with an aggressive offensive mindset. You know, and I think they're going to need Tatum to be aggressive offensively if they want to go deep into the playoffs, if they want to beat teams like Cleveland, Toronto, Washington. You know, you need consistent scores. You need guys who can score points every night, you know, guys who can take over stretches of basketball games and guys who can win games for you. I mean, the Celtics are only 21st in the NBA in points per game. And after Kyrie Irving at 24 points per game, there's a pretty big drop off there. You go from Kyrie at 24, your second leading scorer is Jalen Brown at 14 points. Tatum scoring just about 14 points too, and Al's, you know, about 13, 14 points as well. But there's a big drop off there going down from 24 to uh to 14. Now, I mean I mean you end up facing Cleveland in the playoffs, you're going to have to score points, you know, because Cleveland right now, they're scoring 110 points per game. They're top five in the NBA in points per game, you know, and this is the time of year in the playoffs where teams kind of turn it up a notch. And LeBron right now is giving you 27 points per game, playing some amazing basketball. Kevin Love is scoring 20 points per game. Isaiah Thomas, 18 points per game. And he's only playing 20 minutes a game. He's on a minutes restriction, playing 20 minutes, scoring 18 points. So, and Isaiah, we assume, you know, we're rooting for Isaiah. I am, so I'm hoping come playoff time, you know, he is firing on all cylinders and he is knocking down shots. You know, and I'm really rooting for Isaiah. I I really am. Like, you figured that you, you would think that, I would be torn by this, you know, wanting to see Isaiah perform well and then wanting the Celtics, you know, to beat um, Cleveland and have some mixed feelings about it. Well, I guess I kind of feel like I want to see Isaiah score 50 points to see the Celtics still win, you know. Um, I am rooting for the guy, obviously. I think many of us Celtics fans uh, really are. So, I mean, when he plays Boston in February at TD Garden, you know, I'd like to see Isaiah Thomas go off in that game. Says he wants to put on a show. I'd love to uh, I'd love to see it from IT. Of course, I want the Celtics to win, but I would like to see him come back to TD Garden and just light it up. So that's the new Cleveland Big Three. Cleveland Big Three. I call him the Triple L, LeBron, Love, and the Little Guy. So getting back to Chase Tatum, so I guess the, the point is is that Cleveland scores a ton of points. They don't play a lick of defense, but they score a ton of points, and you're going to need to keep up with that, you know, come playoff time. So Jason Tatum, you know, I'd like to see him, you know, have that aggressive offensive mindset, you know, and attack the basket and, you know, use those moves that he's got to be able to create some space and create his own shot, you know, keep knocking down these shots and stuff like that. You know, Kyrie, again, the only consistent high-volume scorer on the basketball team. You know, Al's a great offensive player. He can score inside. He can shoot the three. But, you know, he's not necessarily a guy that's going to take over the game and be super aggressive offensively. He's a I-let-the-game-come-to-me type basketball player. You know, if he's got a good matchup in the low post, you know, he'll take advantage of that. You know, if he's got an open three... He's going to shoot it, and he's going to knock it down at a high percentage as well, but not that, you know, aggressive offensive player. And I think Tatum has the skills to be that kind of guy. You know, he's he's obviously he's got the moves, you know, and like I said, you know, he can create his own shot. He can attack the basket, finish the rim, all these things. You know, he has the skills. He's already one of the team's best shooters. He's shooting 50% from the field. He leads the team in three-point percentage at 46%. He's got the physical tools. He's got that size and length. He's got the athleticism. You know, a play that sticks out for me is 
in that last game versus Charlotte, he went between the legs to get past the initial defender, drives the lane, and immediately goes into a Euro step, lays it in. You know, I mean, multiple moves on the same play, you know, to get past that first guy and then to be aware that there will be additional defenders near the bat, the basket and to keep those guys away with that Euro step. You know, that's really tough to defend. You know, that's like next level type of stuff. Lots of guys have a Euro step, but, you know, not everybody's doing like this, you know, between the moves. I'm going to get right by you immediately go into a Euro step. I mean, that's like next level type of stuff. So, I mean, he's making a lot of those like tip your cap type of plays. You know, like when the defense clamps down and you play good defense for 20 seconds, you know, you're smothering the guy with the ball, you know, and, and then all of a sudden with just a couple seconds left on the sh- shot clock, they, you know, take a step back or a fall away and you can test it the best you can. I mean, that's all you can ask is try to make the shot as difficult as possible, but they step back and knock down an awesome shot. It's just like, you know, just kind of tip your cap. You know, so with Jason Tatum, um, you know, I, I'd like to see him have that aggressive offensive mindset. I mean, I would like to see him score 20 points per game, but I get it. He's only 19 years old. It's really difficult to ask a 19-year-old who's already been so amazing to do more, you know, and this is obviously... This is not what we expected Jason Tatum's rookie season to be. I mean, we didn't expect him to be able to shoot the ball as well as he's been shooting. And we knew he would have a big role. Um, You know, we thought he would be coming off the bench early on, you know, with Marcus at the four and uh, Marcus Morris and then uh, Gordon Hayward. Gordon Hayward. Thought Gordon Hayward would be the uh, three. So we thought we'd be seeing Tatum you know, at least to start the season, coming in off the bench and maybe being a little bit of a spark offensively with that second group. You know, so he got thrown into a much bigger role early on. And he's just he's just been fantastic. He really has been. And again, it's really difficult to ask, you know, a 19-year-old who's already been so amazing to do more, but you just want to see him just have that uh, aggressive offensive mindset. And Brad Stevens said after... Uh, after Tatum won the uh, Rookie of the Month award for December. Brad Stevens said, you want to see him build off of this. You know, you want to see him, you know, keep uh, keep dazzling the way that uh, he has been. So speaking to Al Horford, he did uh, sit out the Nets game with a left knee soreness. He suffered the injury versus the Timberwolves on Friday. So he goes to the locker room during that T-Wolves game. Later comes back with a sleeve on his knee. He ends up playing the rest of the game. And, you know, it seemed like, I don't know if he was close to playing that next game. He uh, tested it before the game, and he said it just didn't feel right. You know, so they decided to uh, take the night off. So right now, Al is just considered day-to-day And he hopes that he plays in London. Now, that game isn't until Thursday. So, you know, an extended layoff for the Celtics. So he'll have time to rest up. I don't really know how serious the injury is. So I don't know if he'll be able to play Thursday. But we do know that the Celtics have a few days off. So he'll have uh, some extra time to uh, rehab the injury. So Isaiah Thomas... Isaiah Thomas and the big video tribute debate. So Danny Ainge confirmed on Thursday that this video tribute is going to take place, like it or not, February 11th, which is the same day as Paul Pierce's jersey retirement ceremony. Now, the original plan for that video, it was supposed to happen in that last Cavs game at TD Garden last week. But uh, Isaiah reached out asked if they would postpone it. Celtics uh, were okay with Isaiah's request, so they did. And Isaiah, his uh, thinking on that, he said was, what he said was, I wanted to play the game that I was going to be 
uh, the game that was going to feature the video tribute, and I'm going to make my grand return, and I'm going to get showered with applause and all this stuff. He's like, I want to be able to play in that basketball game, and he fully understand that. You know, he had just come back from injury, and they hadn't played the night before, and of course he's on a minutes restriction, and they're not letting him play back to backs. And that Celtics game was on the second night of a back to back, so he didn't play. And Isaiah says, not only does he want to play when he gets his tribute. He wants to put on a show. He wants to put on a show. He's not calling it a revenge game, but he says he does want to light it up. And uh, I hope he does. I want to see him light it up. You know, even if if the Celtics lose this game, we'll see Isaiah Thomas go off. It's just one basketball game, as long as it didn't cost him like home court or something like that. He also said that one of the reasons why he didn't want to do it in that last game versus the Cavs was because uh, he wants his family to be there. And he said that his mom and dad may be there February 11th. So he says that's very important to him. He says he wants his family to understand how much the fans loved him. And you know what? (laughs) The, The fans do love him, but I think maybe it's time for Isaiah to let this go, you know, and to move on. You know, I get it. Isaiah was beloved in Boston. He loved the city. The city loved him right back. And... You know, for all the things that he did uh, to have such an amazing season last year, one of the you know one of the great single seasons by an individual player ever for the Seas, score twenty nine points per game. To you know, you know, to have to deal with the death of your kid's sister as the playoff start, you know, and travel back and forth between Washington State and Boston you know, to have a a hip injury and to play through that pain, you know, to play through an injury that ended up costing you a big chunk of the following season, to get your teeth knocked out, to have to undergo oral surgery and spend the first part of the day, you know, getting oral surgery and then spending that, that evening, that same day, playing a NBA playoff basketball game. You know, for him to you know, put in all the hard work uh, and to give it all he could, you know, fans loved him before he did that. and They loved him even more afterwards. And, you know, I understand that Isaiah Thomas is disappointed, heartbroken by being traded. You know, all those things I just mentioned on top of the fact that he loved being the guy. This is the first opportunity. Someone really gave him the keys to the car and said, go out there and win it for us. And he he was so grateful that he had that opportunity. And he loved that spotlight. He loved carrying a basketball team. So all that stuff is taken away from him. But, I mean, all these months later, he's still talking about it. It's like, Isaiah, I mean, you got to move on. Like, I... I fully believe him when he says I'm committed to the Cavs and I want to win a championship with Cleveland. I mean, I I believe that, but he's still talking about Boston. And, you know, he's been saying lately, I want my family to understand how much Boston loves me. It's time to turn the page, Isaiah Thomas. But I think that night, this game versus uh, the Cavs, it's going to be a special night. I really do. Uh, I mean, what a game that's going to be. I mean, first of all, you got the Cavs and the Seas going at it. Always excited about that matchup. You get an Isaiah Thomas tribute. You get an IT return. And then you get a Paul Pierce ceremony afterwards. This game is going to be epic. This game is going to be awesome. You know, this Paul Pierce ceremony is taking place after the game. So, I guess I have no problem with Isaiah Thomas getting a couple of minutes during the game in a video tribute, some applause when he touches the ball by the fans and stuff like that, and then after the game, Paul Pierce gets honored. So, I guess I have no problem with that. Now, Paul said the night that he gets his jersey retired, This is what he said. The night I get my jersey retired, I'm not sure I want to look up at the Jumbotron and see Isaiah Thomas highlights. So I understand that. Pierce said that he went to the Kobe Bryant jersey retirement uh, or the the Kobe Bryant uh, ceremony, the jersey retirement ceremony. 
He went to that game. And they played Kobe Bryant videos during stoppages throughout the game. And Paul Pierce said that he really enjoyed watching those videos throughout the game. But he wants the Celtics to do the exact same thing for him. So, I mean, Isaiah Thomas is taking a backseat to Paul Pierce that night. It is Paul's night. You know? I mean, especially if they're going to play Paul Pierce highlights throughout the game. It's Paul Pierce's night. Isaiah is taking a back seat because highlights throughout the basketball game. Isaiah Thomas is not going to get that. You know, you give him like a two or three minute video. You you cheer for him when he makes a basket or handles the ball or whatever. You know, you do those things, but you obviously don't play Isaiah Thomas highlights throughout the game because he plays for a different team now. That would just be weird, and I'm sure Isaiah would love to have his highlights played throughout the basketball game. But, you know, that's not going to happen. I mean, Isaiah Thomas knows that. So, I mean, with, you know, with the ceremony afterwards and maybe some Pierce highlights throughout the game, I mean, this is Paul Pierce's night. Isaiah Thomas is taking a taking a, uh, a, a back seat here. Ideally, you do this on separate nights. I mean, I would prefer to have these things done on separate nights. That's, you know, that's the way it should be. But the situation is what it is and I don't think it's the end of the world all right next up for the Celtics they got this game in uh, London versus Philadelphia Celtics Sixers Thursday 02 arena three o'clock tip off eastern time what three o'clock I got work to do that sucks I'm gonna DVR anyway you know, so I guess it really doesn't matter to me. London is five hours ahead of us, so it's going to be eight o'clock their time. Uh, first regular season game in London for the Celtics. Uh, first regular season game in London for the Seas, period. They did play there once before in 2007 versus Minnesota, but that was a preseason game. Second regular season game outside of the U.S. or Canada for the Seas. Mexico City game versus Sacramento. So it's going to be really, really cool. I, I believe uh, NBC Sports Boston's doing like two days of coverage leading up to the actual game itself. So it, it should be cool. Again, uh, game at, at 3 o'clock, so a lot of folks going to have to watch it afterwards, later on after work. Uh, that's usually what I do anyway with these Celtics games. So I DVR all these games, and uh, I don't get out of work until 7 o'clock. You know, I get out at 7, and then I might go to the gym or something like that. I might go to the grocery store, come home, cook dinner. And by the time all that crap's done, it's like the game's like half over or more. So I'm used to watching these games later on and stuff like that. I I always try, when I watch the games later on, I always try to avoid finding out who won the basketball game because I want it to be a surprise, you know. Like if it's a close finish, I want to know. Like I, I don't want to know how it ends. I want to experience that uh, exciting game firsthand and not you know hear about it before, which is very difficult to do. It's difficult to uh, to avoid Celtics news to you know until you're able to actually watch the game. It's easier to do for a couple of hours, but sometimes there are days where I don't get to watch the game. You know, that night at all, I won't watch it until the following night. So it's pretty hard to go a whole day without figuring out what's, uh, what happens. All right. I am Eric Vandenbosch, and I survived uh, this podcast. I didn't think I'd be able to talk for 30 minutes straight. I, I thought that my voice would or my throat would get all scratchy and stuff like that, and I'd start coughing up a lung. I thought that I would actually have to stop this broadcast several times to get a sip of water or a pop a new uh, cough drop or or something, but uh, but you know I I soldier on. I'm a you know I am a, I'm a gamer. That's it, man. I am I am a gamer. Okay, so anyway, I'll be back next weekend. Next weekend, no extended absence BS. I'll be back next weekend, and we will talk about the London game. Uh, So take her easy. I'll uh, talk to you later. Go Seize.